I'm in Scarborough, on the northeast coast of Yorkshire. I'm about to start walking what is nowadays known as the Cinder Track, but was originally the line of the Scarborough and Whitby Railway, which opened in 1885 and finally closed to passenger traffic in March 1965, along with many other lines, as a result of the notorious Beeching Report. Scarborough Borough Council acquired the 21 miles of trackbed, and since then it has served as a walking and cycle route. Those who keep their eyes open on this short journey will be treated not only to some lovely landscape, but an insight into some fascinating details about the history of the area. Its people, its industry, and a way of life, the memory of which is disappearing beneath brambles and overgrown verges. In a manner reminiscent of children's steam engine books from the 30s, the trains on this railway needed to be reversed in order to reach the terminal stations. Here, just outside Scarborough Station itself, the train was reversed to commence its journey to Whitby, and it immediately entered the first of two tunnels on the line. The tunnel was constructed in 1882 and was 260 yards long. It was built using the cut and cover method, which entailed digging a trench, building the tunnel structure itself, and then covering it up again. The tunnel led to a goods yard that carried the macabre name of Gallows Close. This signpost marks the beginning of the route. Not very picturesque so far, you might say. But even here, we can scrape beneath the surface of what we see today to get a picture of how things were back then. From 1863, plans were made and proposals put forward to construct a railway line. But it wasn't until 1872 that building work actually commenced. A shortage of capital, combined with the challenge of having to engineer the route over difficult terrain, continually stalled construction efforts, which continued only in fits and starts for a period of over 13 years. The official opening, a ceremony marked by an inaugural train run, did not happen until the 16th of July, 1885. The first stop on the line was the station here at Scolby, just a few yards over there, which was demolished in 1974. No trace of the buildings or platform now remain. The original route to the station took the line over Scolby Beck, via a cast iron bridge, but after the appalling Tay Bridge collapse in 1879, when over 70 passengers were killed, engineers grew more cautious, and the bridge here at Scorby was dismantled in 1881 without a train ever having passed over, and replaced by this rather striking four-arch brick viaduct at a cost of £4,188. The next village on the line is Burniston. There was no station here, but it is from this point that the trail begins to enter the countryside proper. It's just under a mile from Burniston to the second station on the line, Cloughton. This one has survived and is today run as a tea room for visitors. So, Steve, you're the lucky man who lives in this beautiful place. I am, yes. Beautiful garden. Tell me, when did you first get the station? We bought the station in 1992 after I came across with my previous job. And how long had it, how long had it been out of action by then? Well, the railway's closed in 65. Yeah. A couple of, old, couple of people bought it privately. Yeah. And it was on the market from, I believe, 1988 until we bought it in 1992. And do you have to do a lot of work to it? Yes, yeah, we, we liked the idea of the railway station, we wanted to keep the feel of the railway station, which obviously we modernised things, but uh, yes, yeah, so we worked every day on it, <laughs> 22 yeah. years. And, and this is, presumably the middle bit is the station master's house, is That's it? That's correct, I think you tend to find that the, the two storey parts are the house bits and the, okay. the working parts of the station are the single storey parts. Is there still anything like a ticket hall in there that, um, that you've converted into something? No, the, t the ticket office was combined with the station master's room. 
the booking office, which is that one down there, which is now one of our bed and breakfast rooms. And the lounge, our lounge is the, was the waiting room and the ladies' waiting room. Okay. And this is new. We put this extension on here to balance the building up. And you made a real feature of the platform. It's like a sort of garden border. Yes, originally it went straight across. We, we dropped it, obviously, for access. Yeah. Uh, and I hear you've got some camping coaches here. We have Is one camping coach, yes, Oscar, our camping coach, which we brought in in 2003. Can you tell me exactly what, what, what are camping coaches and, and what purpose did they serve? Well, I don't know about the prices, but you, I suppose you'd class them as a cheap holiday, really. The uh, families came, spent the week in them, mm -hmm. um, quite often got the, some of the supplies from the station master, the milk and the, the eggs, bought things locally. So they were for holidays rather than just for people who needed to stay somewhere overnight while they were travelling? That's right, they were holidays and they were quite official I believe. Some of the British Rail brochures had the camping coaches and the prices in. It was, it was an official thing with the railways, yeah. But they, did but they have their own kitchens and stuff? Yes, yes. I think they were fairly basic, not as we have now, but uh, mm. certainly it was a, a home away from home when you were on holiday with your children. And they were quite a feature of this line? Yes, uh, I believe that of the stations on this line there were just Haven Wyke and I believe Filey Dales that didn't have the camping coaches, okay. the others did. Scorby Station closed a few years before this one and some of their buildings were actually turned into station cottages. Yeah. Uh, but as coaches, the many, many stations on the line had them, yes. And you keep the tradition going by renting this one out? We do, yes yeah. we do. Yeah, it's very good, very popular. We uh, Again, we try to keep the feel of the railways but modern, fairly everything in that you want is in there. Maybe we could have a look at it. Is there Indeed. a chance for that? We certainly can. Let's go and have Fantastic. a look. Thank you. <coughs> Right, should we uh, let's have a look inside? Yeah, love to, thank you. <coughs> so these are the original carriage seats, are they? Yes, they are. We had them restuffed and recovered, but the springs are the same, at the same position. Oh, I did raise this one up five inches. Oh, yeah, it makes good old British rail sound, doesn't it? <laughs> you would need that when you're travelling <laughs> on the... Uh, it's only in some ways a lot more comfortable than today's. Yes. Yes, yeah. a couple of, uh, this is a beautifully equipped camping cottage. Fully equipped kitchen. Yes, everything's in that you need. It's all slightly narrower than normal because I couldn't get the full wood stuff through the door, but uh, yeah. everything's in that you need. So you say it's 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 watertight, but it's in some ways vulnerable to the weather. It is. Uh, the problems we get are mainly around the window frames because they have rubber seals which yeah. obviously perish, and these are now fifty years old. Yeah. So I have to improvise and uh, do what I can. Each winter we redecorate somewhere, usually this room. It sways in the wind, you say? It, it does indeed. 34 <laughs> tonnes, it moves in the wind, yes. Very romantic. Yes. Oh, there's the kitchen. Well, thanks very much indeed, Steve. It's been my pleasure. Thank it's you very much for coming to see your place. Thank, Thank you. you. So how far is it to Haven Wake there from here? It's just over two miles north. Well, I better get going. OK, all the best. Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye-bye now. A gentle climb for the next two miles takes us to Hayburn Wyke. This station, including its platforms, was originally built of wood. Then it was rebuilt with a station building being moved to the other side of the track. The station master's house, built in 1892 for just 330 pounds, still survives. Till then, the Hayburn Wyke Hotel, a short distance away, provided his accommodation. 
In the early 1950s, the station building received electricity and was brought into use as a camping cottage. Visitors today can take the opportunity to leave the track bed here and take a walk in the beautiful woods below the pub that lead down to a secluded rocky shore. In times gone by, the infamous buccaneers and smugglers who frequented the North Yorkshire coast would have found it an ideal spot to land their illicit goods. Another mile and a half up the line and we arrive at Staintondale, a more substantial station, and today a private residence, with both platforms surviving. The station here looks much as it would have done a hundred years ago. It's more peaceful and pretty, perhaps, but the ghosts of all that coming and going still seem to hang over the place, not in an eerie or sinister sense. Quite the opposite. It's that peculiar warmth that the stamp of human activity seems to leave behind, what I call the romance of history. The siding constructed here was to service a local quarry. Trucks were loaded with stone, which was then taken down the line to Scarborough. And after a two mile steep gradient of one in 41, we come to what is the real ghost town of the line at 631 feet, the highest point on the route, Raven's Car. Today's visitor sees only the sad remains of the station, which was originally called Peak. It is hard to imagine that this station was at one point intended to serve a purpose-built holiday resort, a newly constructed coastal jewel to rival Scarborough itself, but which in fact never materialised. Raven's Car, or Peak Station, originally had just one platform, but in 1908 a passing loop was constructed in timber and both platforms were provided with wooden waiting rooms. It's here that we get a glimpse of the continuous bickering that took place between the Scarborough and Whitby Railway, who owned the line itself, and the North Eastern Railway, the company that operated the trains passing along it. The North Eastern Railway requested in 1886 that a station master's house be built, but when nine years later it still had not happened, the NER decided enough was enough and closed down the station completely on the 6th of March, 1895. This almost petulant action was exactly what was needed to push the S&W into finally giving in and building the required house. The station, with its now properly accommodated station master, was duly reopened on 1st of April, 1896. In 1895, the Ravenscar Estate Company bought the whole of the vast Peak House Estate for £10,000 and great plans were made for the construction of a resort town to the east of the station, of the type that was becoming increasingly popular the length of the coast, complete with holiday homes, tea rooms, hotels, public gardens and shops. The area was divided into over 1,500 building plots, streets were laid out, pavements and drains constructed. But what the planners had not taken into account were the bitter North Sea winds to which this exposed hilltop site was vulnerable, and, even more short-sighted this, the absence of a convenient route down the cliffs to the seafront below, which had no sand, just a rocky shore. The result was that the town was never built, and in 1913 the company went bankrupt. It had, however, succeeded in changing the name from Peak to Ravenscar in 1897. 
Raven Hall, originally called Peak House, was built in 1774 and was once owned by Dr. Francis Willis, the physician famous for having treated King George III's madness. Although Willis's methods were primitive and brutal by today's standards, he earned celebrity status for his efforts and friendship of the king in the long term, as well as a generous lifelong pension. When the railway was proposed, Raven Hall was in the ownership of one W.H. Hammond, who insisted that the line must have a tunnel, although this was not in fact necessary, and a cutting would have been much cheaper. The 279-yard curving tunnel was actually completed in 1876, but was almost farcically found to be out of line and had to be rebuilt in 1883. Climbing up the incredibly steep gradient towards Raven's car on cold wintry days, steel on frozen steel, curving their way up through this tunnel was a notoriously difficult task for engine drivers of the day. From Ravenscar Station to the next halt at Filing Hall is just over three miles with a gradient of one in 39, the steepest part of the line, which offers fabulous views north over the expanse of Robin Hood's Bay. Just south of the Northern Tunnel portal, the line passes through an area known for a certain kind of industrial procedure which had been operated here since long before the railway arrived. Alum, a fixative in the textile dyeing process, had been produced here since 1640. It was a process which involved burning vast quantities of locally mined shale, which was then steeped in vats and blended with large quantities of human urine harvested from donors in the streets of London. A similar procedure was used to fix dyes in ancient Roman times, and to this day in Pompeii you can see depositories where passing customers could relieve themselves and earn a few coins in the process. A similar business was doubtless thriving on street corners in 17th century London, after which vatfuls of the stinking liquid were shipped up here, only to be returned as finished alum when the procedure was complete. The remains of the factory where the alum was made have been excavated and can be visited. You can see the remains of the old alum works down there on the edge of the cliffs. Cheaper and better fixatives were later discovered, and the industry here closed down in the 1860s. In 1900, Whittakers opened a brick factory on the site of the old Alum Industrial Works to produce bricks for the fantasy resort being planned at Raven's Car, which never actually got built. But the brick manufacturers were confident enough about the project to have the word Raven's Car inscribed on every single brick until it became a brand in itself, and they can still be found in the area to this day. They continued in production until about 1940, and Ravenscar bricks were used in the construction of the Odeon Theatre in Scarborough. Continuing round Stoop Brow with spectacular views, the line passes the hamlet of Howdale and then swings north to cross Stoop Beck by the largest embankment on the line. It contains some 400,000 cubic yards of shale brought down from the old alum works. The railway now passes beneath a high road bridge with some fine brickwork in its arch before crossing a stream and a road to enter Filing Hall Station. The halt is in a very poor state today, but there are still some remains of what was once here, buried beneath the undergrowth. Passing the station master's house, the line descends to cross Millbeck by another embankment, then up through a cutting 
from which you emerge to see the houses of Filingthorpe and Robin Hood's Bay. Camping coaches would have been passed just before entering the station. Robin Hood's Bay was the busiest station on the line, and most of the station buildings, originally lining the southern platform, remain to this day, though put to different use. The brick-built signal box is now a small workshop, and the wooden refreshment room now provides offices for the Northeast Geology Trust. The goods warehouse has become part of the Filingdale's Village Hall. The northern platform with its wooden waiting rooms and water tower have completely disappeared. Right, we've now come to what was once Robin Hood's base station, is now a private home, um, the home of Rob Reimer, who's very kindly agreed to show us around. And uh, his front door is what was once the waiting room. Hello, Roland. Morning, Rob. Uh, nice to see you. How you, you doing? Right? Yeah. Good man. Thank you very much for Do you want to have a look around? To Love to. Thank Excellent. You. So we come straight into what was originally the waiting room, now your, your living room, I guess. That's right, yeah. yeah. So yeah. How, how long have you had the station? Well, I bought the place in 1992. And I've been living here full time since uh, 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, it was used as a cafe and then a cafe gallery in the early days, in the uh, early 90s. Right. And then uh, I took uh, took residence full time in uh, 2000. It was it a private house before you had it? No, no, it was uh, an old folks meeting room. What, what's really interesting about this room is the hatch through to um, yeah. what I gather is the Ticketmaster's office on the other side. That's right, yes, yes. They'll have uh, formed an orderly queue to, uh, to buy the tickets. Because uh, it was very busy? It was probably one of the busiest on the line, on the whole of the line, on the Whitley to Scarborough line at the time. Because um, of the population of Robin Hood's Bay? Or? I just guess it was a nice place, you know. Yeah. And I think yeah. people promoted it quite well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And so they'd come in the door over there. They'd yeah. sit around, they'd queue here for the, uh, to buy the tickets through the hatch. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there was a, uh, some, I don't know if you can see them down there, the, the ends of the uh, wooden posts there. There used to be like a barrier Absolutely. there that yeah. stopped, yeah. stopped them rushing to buy the tickets, so they yeah. formed an orderly queue. Yeah. <laughs> and in summer, that, that queue might even have gone out the door. It might well have done. It yeah. might well have done, yeah. We worked out there was probably two or three million people through this room in, yeah. its, in its time, yeah. So when we get the odd one wandering in now, thinking it's a public building, we don't. We tell them that's it. Don't mind you. You know, not the first. Go to some <laughs> holiday makers. Yeah. <laughs> okay. that's it, yeah. Let's have a look next door. Okay, sure. Thanks. So now we're on the station master's side, and looking at this sort of um, tongue and groove timber divide, you really can get a feel of what it was like in a station master's office at the time. I know it's your kitchen and your office now, but uh, there, there's definitely that flavour that still exists. Mm. Um, some of this furniture, you say, is original. Yes, all this is original. Yeah, um, all the handles are original. Um, apart from those that my dad took off a bank in Sheffield, but all the rest of them are uh, as they were. Uh, cash drawers and things. Cash drawers, yes. Which is the, the, now the fridge and freezer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This is the other side of the hatch, of course, where we were before. Uh, you can um, still see the little mark round there where there used to be the rubber, the little carousel for the rubber stamps, where they stamp the tickets, and then these marks round here are where they'd sort of uh, stamp it and make so it. So station master there. would lean over here. Yeah, so the chap would be looking through here. Um, <laughs> Robin does be, yes, certainly to Whitby, no problem. Take his stamp from there, yeah. stamp it, pass it through, and Bob's your uncle. So here in the corner of your of your office mm. is what looks like the original station clock. Yes, right. it is, yeah, yeah. Interestingly enough, when I, when I bought this place from Scarborough Council, they were wanting to take it out and put it in a museum. Um, mm. And they sort of had to uh, negotiate, shall we say, to make sure it stayed there, because it's part of the building. It really is part of the building. I mean, that is the, that's the wood, oh, yes. as you can see. Yeah. The mechanics of that, the whole thing comes out. And uh, anyway, as you can see, it's still, it's still ticking away for all these years. And it told the station master <laughs> what time it was, but it also told the passengers, because yeah. isn't there something on the other side? There is. Um, there's a mechanism that goes through. It's not coupled up now, unfortunately, so it doesn't work the outside face. Yep. But the, uh, the same mechanism works a, a clock on the outside. 
So, uh, you know, as a, as a station plot for the passengers. Right. So, yeah. And how often do you have to wind yeah. it up? About once a week. Yeah. Once a week. And yeah. it still keeps good time? It still keeps really good time, actually. Yeah, it's, it's really good, yeah. I've had the whole thing out about three times in the last 20 odd years and oiled it and give it a bit of a brush down, but that's all. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That was all very interesting. Thank you very much oh, indeed. Well, thank you very much. It'd be nice, nice to see you. you. Yeah, yeah, take care then. All the best to you. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. The isolated coastal location of the village lent itself to the shady pursuit of smuggling through much of the 18th century. After which, Robin Hood's Bay became a sort of retirement village for seafarers. As with Ravenscar, the coming of the railway attracted building speculators keen to make money out of the seaside resort boom, and land was acquired close to the station for development, resulting in the 1890s in the construction of residential villas and the Victoria Hotel. The promise of hot and cold running water and spacious rooms proved to be too tempting for many residents of the old bay town, and a number of them migrated up the steep hill into these posh modern properties, leaving vacant their quaint old cottages close to the sea. The newly built railway brought the promised visitors in their hordes, and so began the thriving tourist industry which continues to this day. Our journey now continues out of the station through a cutting and before the line turns to the north opens up to yet another spectacular view, this time to the south with a great expanse of sea, moorland and the heights of Ravenscar. Now heading inland and away from the sea, we are greeted by the first view of our destination, Whitby, with its abbey dominating the skyline as it has for over a thousand years. The line descends gently from this point to Horska Station, the only one on the line to be built entirely of brick. Today the station master's house is a private home. Jeff Bailey lives here and used to work on the Scarborough and Whitby Railway as a signalman. So it's particularly interesting talking to you, Jeff, because you were actually employed on this line, is that right? Yes, I was uh, employed as a relief signalman from 58 uh, to 58, 59 until 64. Were you? Goodness. Yeah, that... when this line was still open then in them days. So were you employed by the LNER or by the uh, well, Scarborough and Whitby? Well, when I first entered on the railways, which was in 19... Uh, 48, of course it became British Rail, Oh yes. but uh, in them days we were still wearing NER uniforms. Right, right, okay. But up here it was BR of course. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, I had to cover all the signal boxes between Whitby and Pickering actually, and Westcliffs right through to Scarborough. Well, travelling between each one? Yes, oh yes. By what, uh, by what mode of transport? Well, <laughs> um, motorbike and, and anything like that. Yeah. Uh, I managed to get to live in at Cloughton Station House. As a rare woman claiming lodging allowance, mm -hmm. I got the first priority for it. Okay. So I lived at Cloughton and uh, actually the front room of the Cloughton, uh, which is now a, a restaurant, yeah. cafe, my youngest son was born in there. Was he? <laughs> is he <laughs> in really? 61. In 61? In same si age as me. Si 61 he was. Yeah, same age as me. Good year. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, so, how, so you finished in 1964? Yes. Uh, October 64, because by that time, we knew very well that the line would be closing in March 65. Mm. And just tell me briefly what a signalman had to do uh, when you got to the box. Well, on, on, these, on these lines here, uh, apart from Robiners Bay, um, the station master at Robiners Bay, of course, he had his own clerk. So the signal box at Robiners Bay was manned by two porter signalmen. But all the rest of them, such as, well, Prospect Hill was 
uh, really it was ordinary signalling, but uh, Ravenscar, Statendale and Clown, the station master took one shift mm -hmm. and the porter signalman took the other shift. And this is where <laughs> I ended up by uh, by actually covering for station masters at time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think the station master's pay back there. So in 1964, then it all came to an end for you here. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. You, 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 you're still very sentimental about the line. We're oh, living yeah. on it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, I've been a signalman what uh, 35 years actually. Yeah. And uh, it was a mm. job which I enjoyed doing. The, the pay wasn't all that great, I might <laughs> add. Can you tell us what it was at the end, in 1964? Can you remember what the pay was? I think it, I think it releasing one's pay at that time would be about 132 shillings a week. 132 shillings a week? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not... <laughs> it's just about something Goodness. about like, around that scale, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I, I think I'm going to have to get moving along the line again now myself, otherwise yeah. I'm never going to get to Whitby. <laughs> <laughs> very nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you, love. Oh, it's yeah. uh, terrific to see you. Yeah. All the very best. The waiting rooms are now a bike hire centre and cafe, though these two railway carriages in the old sidings could give the casual observer the idea that the line is still in use. One is let out as accommodation, the other is used for bike storage. We are now nearing the end of our journey, but the most spectacular engineering feat of the line is yet to come. The breathtaking Larpool Viaduct was constructed to carry a single track line over the River Esk and its valley near Whitby. These two photographs, taken by Whitby photographer Frank Meadows Sutcliffe, offer a fascinating insight into its construction. Because of its proximity to the sea and the risk of corrosion, the engineers avoided the use of iron, employing brick and cement instead. The design itself was based on the Saltburn Viaduct a few miles up the coast. Construction began in October 1882 and was completed almost exactly two years later in October 1884. The resident engineer was Charles Arthur Rowlandson and the contractors were John Waddell and Sons, the same who had built the replacement brick viaduct up the line at Scolby. It's a structure of 13 arches made up of 5 million bricks. It's 915 feet long with a rail level 120 foot high. The foundations on land were excavated to the level of rock and formed from slag-based cement. The river foundations were excavated in brick-lined wells. The foundation excavations were complicated by the discovery of oak trees found embedded in the river, which required the use of divers to remove them manually from underwater. Piers 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 had triple foundations connected above the water level by two semicircular arches and made of bricks seven deep. The viaduct is mentioned in Bram Stoker's 1897 Gothic novel, Dracula. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. A great viaduct runs across with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on the high land on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see down. Having crossed the viaduct, our journey on the line ends when we connect with the line from Sands End to Whitby. Trains would continue the short distance to Whitby Westcliff Station and then reverse for the descent to Whitby Town Station, curving under the viaduct over which they had just travelled. 
And so, as a result of Dr Beeching's report, the mid-1960s left much of rural England bereft of the puff, whistle, soot and steam of the local train network. Here between Scarborough and Whitby, the line also closed down. It had never made a profit, but came close to doing so during the 1930s. It was certainly a fine piece of British engineering, which served local people and local industries, and for that reason deserves to have its story told. Today, most of the trek continues to be put to good use as a cycling and hiking trail, giving pleasure to many walkers and cyclists, just as it gave immense pleasure to users of the line during its 80 years of operation. It must have been a fantastic journey by steam all those years ago, but all is not lost. It's a pretty good walk now. Goodbye. <laughs>